You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Automatic, the connected car company that improves your driving and integrates your car into your digital life. For more information, visit automatic.com slash insider20 and insert the code INSIDER20 to get 20% off your purchase. That's INSIDER20. I use Automatic, and Automatic works on every car made after 1996. It, it takes just minutes to install, and you get real-time performance data about your driving. You get a little bit of coaching to maximize your fuel economy and wear, reduce wear and tear on your car. And uh, one of the ways that I use it is it integrates with IFTTT and Expensify. And so when I go ahead and drive to the airport for a business trip, I tap that I've gone ahead and tagged it as business, and it goes right into my expense report for the correct mileage. It's really convenient like that. There are no monthly fees or subscriptions required, and it supports the Apple Watch and Pebble. Automatic. Go to automatic.com slash insider20 to get 20% off your purchase. Welcome to an all-new episode of the Apple Insider Podcast, where we talk about Mac, iPod, iPhone, and more. With me is Shane Cole calling in from Hong Kong. What's up? We had this Apple event this week, and the event was was a smaller scale event, but we had some new product introductions. What did we see? Uh, we saw the iPhone SE, which if Neil was here, he would be having an orgasm over. Um, we saw the iPad Pro small. I'm going to call it the iPad Pro Mini. <laughs> <laughs> It's just to sun- confuse the product line, yeah, right? It's not a mini. There's already but it's a like twelve mini iPad Pro. <laughs> yeah, there's already like twelve iPads for sale, and so I'm going to call this one the iPad Pro Mini just to make things further ridiculous. Um, it's uh, the same size as the iPad Air, or yeah, iPad Air uh, comes with the Apple Pencil support and all the nice stuff. And in a stunning development in iPad Pro news, I've purchased one. Have you now? I have. Why? I always said that the moment they release an iPad Air with pencil support, I will buy it. And they did, and I did. True to your word. Yeah, I wasn't joking. Ironically, though, I am now wondering whether it's actually big enough. What makes you doubt? Because I use a Wacom tablet, right? A big Intuos. And that is sometimes a little bit cramped, depending on what you're doing. So I, I wonder a little bit if it might be too small, which I realize is absolutely ridiculous since I spent the last three months saying that the iPad Pro is way too big. We'll see. Live and learn. You could be wrong. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I'll play with it for a couple weeks and uh, we'll have another podcast and I'll give my my very, I'm sure, looked forward to opinion. And we look forward to it, yes. One of the things that I've heard <clears throat> is that there are not just the differences we know about with the iPad Pro to the uh, the smaller iPad Pro or Mini, as you call it, but that there's there's actually a difference in feel of using the pencil on the screen between the two. I heard about that. So what what I understood is that as you drag the the surface of the stylus across the uh, the screen on the larger one, it feels like it's got a bit more tooth or resistance to it, and on the smaller one, it feels as if there's a small thin layer of oil or a slick surface as you drag. Perhaps. And I wait to hear your opinion about this. Uh, what are some of the other differences that caused you to, to think that the Mini was the right choice besides size? Uh, well, I mean, it's 99% size. That's that's all there is to it. If I wanted to carry around something that was 13 inches, I'd just get a MacBook. Which you already have. Yeah. I mean, I if I'm carrying my laptop, I'm carrying my laptop. You know, If I'm carrying my iPad, it's because I want to be portable. I spend... 90% of my life with my iPad and a five notebook and a pen, you know, uh, that's what I, that's my daily carry equipment. And if I can ditch the notebook and the pen and keep the same general uh, weight and size, then I'm all for that. So your laptop pretty much doesn't go with you places. Uh, no, it sits on my desk unless I'm going somewhere specifically to work. But if I'm just going to meetings or, uh, sketching or what have you, it sits on my desk, plugged into its monitor. Okay, we should someday talk about how you work with pretty much primarily an iPad because that, that always intrigues me. Well, I, to, you know, my job is mostly drawing stuff and taking notes, so it's not 
I don't, I don't do, I don't write long word documents on my iPad. You know, if I'm working, I'm sitting at my desk basically. If I'm and when you com- like that, when you compose that's an a- email reply, what are you doing? Well, I don't count that really as work. Doing email, I don't count as work. Or, or browsing the web. Those things are just stuff you do regardless of where you are. You can do those things almost equally as well on a phone as you can on a mm-hmm. Mac Pro. You know. So my thing is if I'm mobile, I'm mobile. If I'm working, I'm working. Okay. We, you, you mentioned the iPhone SE, which is, of course, Neil's favorite. What, what's important to know about that? It is a relatively impressive piece of hardware inside. Uh, it's the iPhone 5 body with some new guts, uh, most, mostly the same guts as the iPhone 6, and actually, and 6S, uh, minus 3D touch. So 4K camera, A9 processor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but no 3D touch, and no, importantly for some people, no second-generation Touch ID. Okay, so in reverse order, what, what is the difference between first and second-generation Touch ID? Uh, the second one is faster. Some people say, and I tend to agree, too fast. Too fast. Why? Too fast. So for me, and I realize that there are a lot of other people who may not share this opinion, but there are also a lot of people who do, I constantly hit the home button on my phone to wake up the display and check my notifications. Right. And with the 6S, recently, my Touch ID is actually a little bit broken. But before... Uh, especially when the phone was new, I would hit the button to wake up the display and it would be unlocked before the display came on. So, so I would never have, see your notifications. You'd yeah. have to swipe down and tap notifications instead of today and get yeah, there again. Exactly. There are some notifications that don't actually show up in Notification Center. They're only on the lock screen, which is a little bit annoying. Yeah, it is. So are you changing habits to press the, 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 the sleep-wake switch? Uh, Try and- I change the way I press the home button. I press it with my knuckle now instead of my fingertip. That just sounds very awkward. No, I mean, it's just like, I guess, punching my phone. <laughs> I mean, when it first came out, we talked about, I really wanted tap to wake. Like they have in the those older LG phones, where you just tap the display and it comes up. That's what I really want. They could totally do it with 3D touch. I don't know why they don't, actually. Well, they, you don't even need 3D touch. Just any capacitive touch to the screen, and it wakes it. Um, I understand well, yeah, but why they don't all do the time. it. Well, there's a reason they don't do a single touch, right? You, it's a double tap usually. Um, and I think LG does a combo of double tap plus accelerate your movement. Because you can tell pretty well from our accelerometer, sorry. You can tell pretty well from the data from the accelerometer which the directionality of the touch, right? Like mm-hmm. you can infer pretty closely whether it was a person's finger on the display. And if you combine that with the uh, capacitance, then I think it's... It's a no. It's for me. It's a no brainer. For Apple, obviously, they have other, other ideas. They have other plans. Yeah. So why did it not get 3D Touch? I'm guessing it was too expensive. Um, Mikey wrote a whole story about this uh, with yeah. going over several possibilities. I personally just think it was probably too expensive, and it, they it looks like didn't want to cut in a margin. Yeah, it looks like Mikey's conclusion was that 3D Touch was designed for the 4.7 and 5.5 inch phones and trying to shoehorn it into the 5 chassis just didn't make sense. I mean, the A9 was designed for those too, and that didn't do anything, and so was the 4K camera. I think it was mostly, so I I tend to to disagree with his assessment. I think it was mostly just about the the margin. Hmm. I mean, this is a company that still charges for iCloud storage. Well, yes. And and we should talk about that too. But just looking at the um, the, the thicknesses of the different phones, the 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 six and six S are clearly thinner, and the SE is is a thicker, fatter phone. So yeah, yeah maybe they ought to have been issued. Well, it kind know. of has to be. So there's two things at play, right? No. There's the fact that it's a little bit thicker in the first place, but that's also necessary because you. When the phone is bigger and thinner, you have more lateral area to put a battery or just stuff in general. Yeah. And when the phone is smaller and fatter, you have to stack those things in vertical space. Right. And and 3D Touch takes up vertical space, but if you're already filling it with the other things that you would have otherwise had lateral room for. Yeah. Really, to me, the biggest surprise is that they kept the mostly unchanged iPhone 5 body. Why do you suppose that is? I think people just really like it. I mean, I know people just really like it. I do. You know, I wish they, if I'm being honest, I wish they had uh, gone back and gone back to black rather than space gray. What have you got against space gray? 
I don't have anything against it per se, but the original iPhone five black on black was, was excellent. I mean, that yeah. was the, of all the iPhones that was by far the best looking out of the box. It didn't work very well after six months, it got dinged up, but out of the box, that was, that was excellent. We used to call it the mm. gangster phone. None more black. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, so, you know, you say that I'm surprised. I wouldn't be surprised to in five years see Apple using that, uh, that true black material that absorbs like 99.5% of visible light. Have you that seen pretty incredible. Have you seen that? Uh, you know, I need to find more examples of that because that, that stuff sounds incredible. So what they do is they, to, to do a sample of it, they crinkle up like some aluminum foil and they spread, sprinkle the stuff on it. And when you look at it from the top, you, it's just a flat plane of nothingness, right? When you look at it from the bottom, you see all the peaks and valleys in the foil. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about a, a service called Upsy. So Upsy is a, a warranty service, basically. And, you know, when, when you go to an electronics store, what, what do they try and do? They try and upsell you on their extended warranty plan, right? Yes. And have you ever bought one of those extended warranty plans? Only Apple Care. Only Apple Care. And I agree, only Apple Care usually makes sense, right? There are the people who buy things like like Square Trade and, and other stuff that uh, also covers the phone after purchase. But Upsy is is a service that covers warranties and, and they're they're calling it sort of a new way to warranty. So what you do is you you go to the app or on their website and you protect all of your devices for fifty to ninety percent off versus the in-store warranties. And you can you can cover smartphones, TVs, laptops, appliances, and more at, at what looks to me like fair prices. And they keep the warranty and the receipt so that if you have a claim, you start the process easily. You don't have to try and dig out a five-year-old receipt or whatever it is, right? So in, in store, right, if you bought a $1,400 TV, they would charge you 180 bucks to protect that TV for two years, right? I'm struggling to find someone who would buy a $1,400 TV who would care about the extended warranty. But yes, I see where you're going. Okay. So – that is a difficulty, but you know, if 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 your parents or grandparents went in and spent that kind of money on a TV, they would get upsold on that kind of a warranty. Through Upsy, it costs fifty four bucks to protect that TV for two years with no deductible. And the app is really well done. And so, when you go to make a claim, you do it either through the app or through the site, and it's really simple to do. And they allow you to get your stuff fixed locally. So you can choose to send it in, or you can take it to a local service center. And they're all about making it easy to fit into your life. Um, there are thousands of people who have chosen Upsy to protect their stuff. Go to Upsy.com, U-P-S-I-E.com, and use the promo code INSIDER for 10% 10 off your first two purchases. That's Upsy, U-P-S-I-E.com, and the promo code INSIDER for 10% off the first two purchases. That's a really weird name. Isn't it, though? Yeah. I get where they were going, but that's a weird name. Naming things is hard. I don't, I don't doubt that. So... You wrote a story this past week about Apple and servers. I did. What's going on? So everyone listening to this podcast is going to be surprised by this, I'm certain. But it turns out iCloud doesn't work very well. <gasps> and I'm shocked. Uh, this, this was the, this was the uh, conclusion arrived at by a website known as The Information, which is a subscription-only tech site. It's like the kind of like the Wall Street Journal for tech, um, or that's their idea anyway. So they wrote a wrote a piece that said, "Hey, the you know iCloud doesn't work very well. The fact that Apple has now signed a big deal with Google to move from a, move some of its load from AWS to uh, GCC or GCE means that it's really not going well," which is not entirely untrue, right? That doesn't seem like a complete leak. That, that that conclusion doesn't necessarily follow. No, the, the the straight line between the two may not necessarily follow, but there is absolutely no question that they can't do what they need to do with the resources they have right now. Okay. Right. They serve billions and billions and billions of requests every day, and they have what three or four functioning uh, first party data centers. Like you can't. You, you just can't handle that kind of load when you don't control 80% of your physical infrastructure, right? Right. Um, I mean, the, it, part of the story was them saying that they tried to buy storage from NetApp 
And for those of you who don't know what NetApp is, it's a major enterprise storage vendor. It, they're they're enormous. And Apple They're actually was, local to me. Apple was too much for everyone's local in the the research triangle. And <laughs> um Apple is too much for NetApp. They, they some people estimate that they have exabytes of data, which is if you don't know, exabyte is a load. Well, so it's it's there's terabytes, which you understand, right? Gigabytes, a thousand gigabytes is a terabyte, a thousand terabytes is a petabyte, and a thousand uh, petabytes. petabytes is a exabyte. Yes, is that right? Yes. Yeah, mass so, quantities of storage. As I said, a load. Oh. So they can't do this, right? Uh, that was the the thrust of their piece, but at the end of their piece, they threw I. This is what we in journalism call burying the lead. At the end of their piece, they said one of the other reasons that Apple is building its own stuff is because they have long suspected that their supply chain was not entirely intact, by which I mean that equipment being shipped from vendors like Cisco and HP and NetApp to Apple's data centers was being wait, wait, wait. Intercepted. compromised. Compromised. Yeah, I was going to say intercepted and then compromised, Go on. but yes. Uh, so if you have followed the Edward Snowden thing, or all the Edward Snowden revelations, one of them was that this program exists from the NSA. And hilariously, they actually took photos of themselves doing it, which is the most ridiculous thing I could possibly imagine the NSA doing. Right. So the photographs are of, of workers in, in cubicles, basically poorly lit, um, altering Cisco equipment. Yes, which Cisco went berserk over they like well, it was insane they, they were they were apoplectic because cisco has a number of problems already with people counterfeiting their products and slapping cisco's name on it and and to the point where people like in the in chinese factories make replicas of cisco gear and put cisco's name on it and sell them and cisco has a whole department dedicated to tracking down this counterfeit gear and you know how they handle warranty how they handle claims on stuff that they never made yeah, and and now they have to not only deal with that, but they have to deal with their own government, our own government, modifying their gear, and them having to support it. It's it's absurd. It would just happen to be that Cisco was like were the people in the pictures, but there's no question, and I don't think anyone's mind that it doesn't happen to every major enterprise vendor, right? Right. And so the story was that the reason that part of the reason Apple wants to build their own stuff is because they have long suspected that this was happening. Like they've gone so far as to ask their vendors to take photos of the motherboards and explain why each and every piece is there, you know, to catch and document exactly kind of what each part is. And yeah. Yeah. So this, I don't understand why that wasn't the headline, but yeah, that's the idea. It's one, they can't do what they need to do with the stuff that's off the shelf. And two, they are absolutely paranoid that they're being, infiltrated from right the the stuff that's off the shelf isn't off the shelf yeah exactly it's on the shelf it's it's been behind the shelf before they ever get to it so they're going to what build their own servers yeah which is nothing out of the realm of normality now i mean google and facebook do it already and amazon does it to an extent uh, amazon does mostly their own networking stuff uh, but they also do a little bit of their own server stuff also well i mean you know, if they want to be end to end certain that all this stuff is is uh, secured, they have to build every part of it, don't they? Yeah. So there's obviously an upper bound on the reality of this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you can't fab every single chip yourself. But the kind of attacks that they're worrying about are not the kind where the NSA infiltrates, you know, NXP. They're worried about the kind where they after the fab before installation, you know, right. which is the part that they can control. Well, you know, they used to make servers, right? They made the X serves back in the day. Yeah. I, they, you know, people one, always, one. People always talk about that, right? But could you imagine actually, did you ever buy an X serve? Uh, I did not actually purchase an X serve, but I, I had one around for a few weeks. All right. Well, first of all, TCO on an older Rackman X serve over the first year was something like 5,000 US dollars each. Mm -hmm. for one of the base models could you imagine stuffing an entire data center full of five thousand dollar servers no way there's no possible way yeah what one of the things i've been wondering about and this is just an idea that's been in my head has been the idea of taking the uh you know the a9x processor kind of stuff that's inside these mobile things and making small servers 
Uh, you know, yeah. Do you need to throw huge hardware at stuff? Not necessarily. If you throw a, a bunch of little ones at it. No, no, no. Uh, ARM-based servers are totally a thing. Uh, Facebook has been doing it for a while. Right. They're low power. They're low heat. Yeah. You know, you, one, one of your big costs in running a data center is powering the air conditioners to climate control the thing. And if you use ARM, you don't have to do that. I mean, for a, a large data center, climate control is not one of the large costs. It's the large cost. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I would agree. They, they totally buried the lead in there. And, and on that subject, so the FBI was going to have this hearing, and it was going to take place almost directly after the Apple event. And the hearing got canceled. The FBI requested that they not have the hearing. Yes. Um, because they said that they, they have another way that they want to try. Which is to get hilarious. the phone. Which is hilarious. Well, first of all, when they filed originally in in the uh, in in their their briefs, they said we have tried every single avenue available. There are no ways into this phone. Apple has to give it up. Were they were they lying, or were they just simply that was true at that time, and now this is true? I mean, nobody really knows. The story changed during the original hearing too, where Comey was like. There may be other things we have. The most ridiculous part of that hearing, by the way, was not all of the extracurricular stuff that went on between the witnesses and the congressman. It was Comey like shouting out, hey, if anyone knows how to do this, please email me. The, direct, <laughs> the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation went on national, international television and said, if anyone knows how to do our job for us, email me. That is the most insane ridiculous thing i've ever heard and gives me total confidence that my data will never ever be accessed by the fbi because they're completely incompetent <laughs> the the only thing better would have been if he'd asked them to uh to, to send him an im via aol yeah exactly <laughs> I, I don't i don't remember which which congressman it was but one of them was like do you why are you even here oh it was icy so why are you even here what kind of what kind of answers are these so, so who are are the FBI going to use instead of trying to, to having done this themselves or uh, ask Apple to do it for them? I don't know. Celebrate, right? That's what I'd heard. It was Celebrate. Yeah. And Celebrate makes forensic tools. They also make um, tools for for retail outfits to uh, to to rescue contacts and photos and stuff yeah. like that off of phones. When you're changing your phone and you need to get it you know, get it upgraded, bore your data over kind of stuff. Yeah. So they, they have some expertise at this. Do you think it's, it's possible? What's, what's the outcome going to be here? Well, there's, there have been attacks against, so here's, I'm not super sure. There have been attacks against the older non secure enclave having phones before by, uh, looping into the this is a really really super simplistic answer so don't yell at me by looping into the power circuitry and then immediately cutting the power the second you realize that the pin you entered was wrong which keeps it from because the the pin enforcement is done in software and not in hardware that keeps it from writing the attempt and incrementing the attempt clock does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So I, I'll, some people think that's what they're going to try and do. And the, the fact that they didn't attempt that beforehand, when you can literally buy the, the, the tools to do this for 100 bucks on eBay, is absurd. Sounds rather time-consuming, right? Because you've got to cut the power and then reboot the whole thing. And... Well, it does it automatically. So you just you know do your thing and... Go out for a coffee. Yeah, basically. All right. Now, let's change topics again. In, in the iPad Pro... They make, of course, the, the Wi-Fi version. They also make the cellular version. Which one did you get, by the way? The cellular. Of course you did. And <clears throat> why did you make that choice? Um, what, what were you thinking? So I've been doing this since the very first iPad. And the reason is because I know that the end of it's so far, it's always been true. There will come a day when I need the cellular functionality. And I will be really annoyed with myself for having not bought it. Because and a, you don't just turn on personal hotspot. On your as a, well, but that doesn't always work, right? Because that's up to whatever carrier you're on. And inevitably, like, like a great example is last year or uh, a little over a year ago, I was in London and I had an international SIM, but 
I was in, I flew into Gatwick and the transit hub from Gatwick to get the train into St. Pancras, my phone had no signal, like none. And I couldn't remember which direction I was supposed to go. And there was crappy Wi-Fi, no cell data on my phone. But my iPad could get LTE, it's like two or three bars of LTE in that spot. And if I hadn't had my iPad, it would have been a huge pain in the ass to get out of the station. You'd have had to have asked someone. Well, no. I. <laughs> the problem with asking someone is I couldn't remember what to ask them. Right? That was yeah. the that was the, per- the issue here. So, yeah, I, there's always, at some point in every iPad's life that I've ever owned, there's come a time in which I needed it to be cellular enabled. Yeah. So, anyway. Like, the one, my Air 2 right, I have right now doesn't have a SIM in it at this moment. And hasn't for probably the last three months. But there have been several times at which I've thrown a SIM in and had to use it. So, cool. So the uh, the, the the but it comes with the Apple SIM, right? Your iPad Air two yes. came with an Apple SIM, and the new one comes with an Apple SIM. Yes. How is the new Apple SIM different from the Apple SIM of the past? Well, so there's two. There's the regular same Apple SIM, right? It's a little plastic card. But there's also an embedded SIM which is a chip on the logic board that I actually, I'll be honest. I don't know if it's a chip or if it's part of another chip, but it's logically speaking, a chip on the motherboard that acts as a virtual SIM card, uh, which is something that they've been pushing for a really long time. And people have been by people. I mean, carriers, because it's always carriers have been resisting. And I guess last summer, Samsung got involved and said, we want to do this. Uh, Let's make it happen. And here we are. Right. And the reason that you do embed a SIM like this is that it means you can cut down on device size. You don't have to have a SIM tray. You don't right. have to have contacts. You, you you can shrink the device because you don't have to have this physical space devoted to the, right. the mechanical interchange of the thing. Yeah. So theoretically, in the future, you won't have to swap cards. You'll just choose a different configuration profile and your SIM will be changed. And carriers reject that because carriers want to to keep you locked in for the foreseeable future. Once you join a, a service, they want to keep you on it. Well, you can do that, which American carriers are doing, even with this embedded SIM, disabling it because they're, you know, idiots. Yeah. But um, the, I, the idea of what you were right, one, is to get the SIM tray thing out of the way. And two, to make what Apple's trying to do with the Apple SIM easier, which is the switching of the of the carriers at will. Right. So at will, you decide you're not satisfied with one carrier, you should be able to just go ahead and change it over and join another carrier, and that's that. Right. You agree to whatever billing practice it is, and then on your way. Yep. And and then change back, or turn it off and turn it back on when you need it, right? You right. shouldn't pay for 24 months of service when you really need it for this critical one month. Yep. Right? Yep. You know, the, the example where your iPad Air 2 hasn't had a SIM in it for a couple of months because you simply didn't need it. But if you do need it, you can pop one in. Yeah, so exactly. here you should be able to just turn the service off and then turn it back on. Yeah, I actually have a T-Mobile SIM here that I picked up, the last, I used last time I was in the States, that has the uh, free monthly tablet data thing. You know right. what I mean? And... I, that was like 200 meg of free tablet data a month yeah. kind of thing. I don't know if I got it at a good time, like they were during a promotion or something, but that plan is not supposed to have, because T-Mobile also has free international roaming for data. It's limited to 3G speeds, um, but it's free. And I don't know if I got mine at a good time or what, but the free tablet plan is not supposed to come with that, and mine does. <laughs> so when I pop my T-Mobile SIM in, I can use it for free um, wherever I am. Very cool. So what's going on is that with this embedded virtual SIM, the T-Mobile and Sprint are fully supporting the built-in Apple SIM feature. AT&T, however, will tie the Apple SIM to its network, lock itself to its network once you associate it with AT&T. Right, which is the same thing that happened with the original Apple SIM. If you buy the iPad at their retail store. Right. Now, what was happening with the original one was that if you bought it anywhere and you associated it with theirs, it stuck to theirs. And Sprint was doing that too at the time, that, that you had to go back to the Apple retail store and request a fresh Apple SIM in order to be able to change again. But I didn't know you could 
Did it, did they lock the sim or did they lock the they tablet? locked the sim? I, I didn't think because I thought when once you did that, your the tablet itself was locked. Mm, it was sold unlocked, certain. and if you activated it on the network, the tablet was locked, and you couldn't just switch the sim again. I I think because of the way Apple does the activation for these things, tablets do not get locked. I think the iPad was always unlocked. And right, the, the iPad's the, always uh, been sold unlocked. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Maybe I'm wrong. It wouldn't be the first but, time. But the SIM they locked because they could. The uh, So here in this case, with the embedded virtual SIM, T-Mobile and Sprint fully support it. You can switch whatever you want to do between T-Mobile and Sprint. AT&T will tie the SIM to its network if you buy the iPad at one of their stores. So you activate on AT&T. That's it. It's done. Verizon requires a separate SIM card and disables the built-in embedded SIM. Mm-hmm. So if you buy it at a Verizon store, the embedded internal one doesn't even activate and they require you pop in the sim train do it the old way right which i think if i'm honest i think for verizon it's just them wanting to do everything the same way across their whole line because verizon supports even though they're a cdma carrier they allow they have sim slots on all their phones for international travel and i have to assume that they just want to keep everything equal well uh, that's not it's not just sim slots are not just for gsm anymore it's sim slots are are used for CDMA or GSM, they're the the way that you do it if you have an LTE phone. Well, they're the way that even before LTE was deployed, Verizon phones had SIM slots. They were doing that as a part of their international travel thing. Yeah. But with the move to LTE, pretty much everything has a SIM slot now. Right. CDMA network or not, it's got an LTE. Oh, I, I, get what, I get what you're saying now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm on board. Cool. So... This concludes this portion of the Apple Insider podcast. Shane, thank you for calling in. What, what kind of parting thought do you want to leave our listeners with? Uh, if I had to leave our listeners with any sort of a, a parting thought, I would say always buy the cellular iPad. For the reasons you stated previously, yes, you've always yes. bought the cellular. Yes. If you, I wouldn't blame you if you did this, but if you skipped through my comments earlier, I would, like, I would encourage you to go back and listen to my fun story about being stuck in an airport and needing my iPad to have cell connection. There you have it. Where do people find you on the internet, Shane? At the website that hosts this very podcast. Well, we will have you back again next week, and we hope to talk to you soon. All right. Have fun. Technology has changed the way we run. Smartphones now allow even casual runners to map their runs, create running playlists, and track their progress. However, taking advantage of these technologies has always meant stopping to look at your phone, which means losing motion and momentum. Until now. Until now. Mara is a hands-free running assistant that uses voice recognition and the microphone in your earbuds to help you optimize your runs. She's hands-free. You talk to her using your earbuds. She uses voice commands, and you tell her what kind of run you'd like to do. You ask her questions about your speed, pace, location, and duration of the weather, and you have her play albums and playlists from your music library. Mara can speak first. She can tell you how you're doing and compare your past runs and records. She'll warn you about changes in weather like it's about to rain. See all your runs and your rough legs and hotspots. Mara recognizes what you've accomplished. Visit mara.ai today to download your free virtual running assistant. So welcome back to the Apple Insider Podcast. This is the second portion of our show. And with me is Andy Summerfield, who is a, uh, an engineer at Affinity Photo. Is that right? Uh, that's absolutely right. Been at Serif Europe Limited for about eleven years now. Um, started in two thousand and five, working on their sort of old line of products, so the Plus range. Sort of did my time for probably six years on there, and then myself and a few other guys sort of thought, well, let's. I mean, our customers back then were always asking us, you know, what, is there a Mac product? Is there a Mac product? We're like, oh no, sorry, there isn't. You know, the code base is only Windows, etc. So we kind of got our heads together and thought, well, you know, why don't we? start again, you know, use all this new tech or this new Apple tech and make uh, some products for the Mac. So we thought, well, that sounds okay. So we got sign off for that. And then sort of five years later, um, we finished our first product, which was Affinity Designer, which is a vector illustration package. And at the same time, we also developed Affinity Photo, which is sort of my half of the deal. Uh, my colleague, Matt Priestley, is, is the vector guy. I, I'm the photo guy. Um, and then sort of last year in July, we finally launched and um, seemed to do pretty well. You know, people seem quite happy. I mean, we've obviously got a load of stuff planned for the app, which should sort of take us through the next sort of two or three years on version one of the app. And they're all they're all free updates for people. So 
so I mean, yeah, so far it's all all going well, and we're sort of sort of plodding along, fixing things, adding new features, and working on our new stuff, which will be iPad iPad versions of things. And and going along well is a little understatement because Affinity Photo won Apple Mac application of the year for Mm -hmm. 2015, I believe. Yeah, I mean, that was a fantastic thing to get. You know, we didn't expect it. In fact, all the guys were actually out um, at a burger place in Nottingham because it was sort of near Christmas. Um, You know, we sort of, at the end of the year, every year, we all go out for a burger and a few beers and stuff. And uh, the phone rang and Tony, my boss, answered it. And then he said, oh, you've won the um, app of the year sort of thing. So, yeah, it was a sort of out of the blue, really. I don't think anybody expected it. But yeah, I mean, it was fantastic news. It was it was excellent. One of the things that, uh, and congratulations on that. Thanks. Thanks. One of the things that I noticed when I was reading the, the App Store copy for Affinity Photo is that it has end-to-end CMYK col- workflow for uh, ICC color management. Yeah, that's true. It's kind of a mouthful to say out loud. Yeah, a um, little bit, yeah. <laughs> can Can you explain what that means? Well, okay. I mean, sort of, you know, for CMYK or for RGB, I mean, you're sort of a guy working on a computer and, you know, people send you stuff or you you shoot stuff or, you know, you scan stuff or, you know, you get stuff from people and then you manipulate it. You use the app to change it. You you add things, you, you adjust things, and then you usually send it to somebody else. You know, that might be a printer or like a third party press or the internet, you know, as like a, a digital image for the internet. And, all those things can be shot or, or, or captured or edited under different sort of lighting conditions. I mean, CMYK presses are all different. You can't necessarily always represent all colors on all devices. I mean, if you look at a sort of really vibrant darkish green or purple, you struggle to print that on most CMYK presses. So the idea of end-to-end management is that as you're working with these things, you're aware of what these limitations are and you can see you can see what the output's going to be or when you pass the thing on to the next person in the sort of chain of people who process the document a you're confident that what you've been given is what that person thought it was and when you give it to the next guy that he can be confident that what you've given him is what you thought it was and that's sort of the principle behind it right so it's the, the person who starts with it can be pretty sure that that what the end result is going to be is going to look the same. Absolutely, exactly. Okay, you mentioned that Affinity has that you have plans for iPad as well. Absolutely, we do. Yes, yes. One of the things that I saw in the announcement on Monday was the the addition of of what Apple is calling a True Tone display. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. To the iPad Pro nine point seven inch, and mm-hmm. they're using ambient light sensors to adjust the, uh, the, the, I'm going to say it wrong. Uh, the, the screen has so many different things going on. They have additional color gamuts. They have all kinds of things, but, yep. but they're, they're adjusting the display and it looked as if it's, I mean, to my unprofessional eyes, if they're changing the white balance. That is pretty much exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. I got that right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if they're doing that, is, is that something that photographers and digital artists should be concerned about is that is that breaking this expectation that what they've made will appear the same way everywhere or uh what's going on here i I think it sort of reinforces it i mean if you look at say take a a sheet of a4 um sort of white paper and you stick it in your living room you know which is likely to have fairly warm lighting you know most people's houses do um it sort of looks white to you It just looks white. And then you take that same piece of paper into your office where you may have, you know, fluorescent sort of cool lighting and that still looks white to you. Okay. now, if if you were to capture that with a bog standard camera in one situation, if that camera didn't automatically correct for white balance, that paper would look blue at the office and it would look sort of yellowy orange at home. That's because paper absorbs light and only reflects some of the light. Now, a screen, a digital screen on an iPad, for example, doesn't really absorb and reflect light. It emits light. So it always emits the same light under all conditions. So while your brain goes somewhere towards compensating for this, a thing called, a thing called a color constancy, you know, your brain will kind of fix the fact that stuff is orange. Like if you go home into your sort of lounge, everything doesn't look orange to you because your brain's fixing it. It's saying, oh, no, I know the light's orange, so the white thing is still white. 
but with the digital screen, it's not necessarily the case. So if you want the digital screen to look like paper, you know, to behave the same way under lighting as paper behaves, then you kind of need to do this thing that Apple are doing, this true tone thing, which is to change the emitted uh, colors from the device uh, to mimic the exact behavior of a piece of paper. Hmm. So, so people shouldn't be concerned, right? If I take a colorimeter and I, I calibrate my screen at my laptop and I calibrate the iPad and I do all these things and then I send the picture to someone else who has one of these true tone displays, yep. I, I, I should not be concerned that it's going to mess up the image and make it worse. And, and Well, first of all, I mean, let's sort of deal with the sort of two types of people who are going to use this thing. Okay. You know, there are people who are going to illustrate on their iPads. So they've got a white canvas and they're just going to draw in the same way as you would draw on, on a sheet of paper. You know, for those guys, this is certainly better. You know, this is a real thing. Like if they use colors in those designs, um, they can be confident that, you know, the colors they're using under whatever lighting they're at are going to look how they think they look when they send them to somebody else. Now, it's sort of been fairly common for years that in a proper end-to-end -end workflow, some guy in an office who's sat at a computer and he's processing images, he will calibrate his screen obviously, he will calibrate it for the type of lighting in the office. And that kind of works because, you know, your computer doesn't move, the office lighting doesn't change, you sort of set it up once and it's all done, it's fine. But an iPad, it's sort of a mobile thing, you take it with you, you go around, you're going to experience loads of different types of lights. You're going to be at home, you're going to be at the office, you're going to be outside, you're going to be in all these different places. So, you could calibrate your iPad every time you took it somewhere else, you know, with one of the little small cameras that you stick on the screen and then make a profile and all these things. But, you know, what Apple are doing here is they're sort of doing that for you on the fly. And that's, that's obviously fantastic for illustrating guys. But then you move on to what does it mean for photographers? Actually, it does mean that when you edit an image on your iPad, you add adjustments, you add all these things that change the image. The thing that you're looking at is what somebody will see further down the line. So yes, it's absolutely valuable for photographers, in my opinion. Okay, that's that's interesting, because that's kind of the opposite of what I've been hearing from from some of our listeners, for example. Oh, okay. okay. Um, they, they were quite concerned that uh, that this is actually worse, but what you're telling me is that this is actually beneficial. In my opinion, it's beneficial, yes, absolutely. So you mentioned that Affinity are going to also have products for the iPad. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Ah, I can, yeah, a little bit, a small bit. Um, <laughs> they're under development at the moment. They're somewhere between alpha and beta, so we can't really show them to anybody outside of the company yet. But um, we've got quite a few guys on them, and so far we're seeing good things. Um, we sort of hope to differentiate from all the other guys on iPad because um, we're aiming to do um, a full, fully featured version of our apps, if you will. I mean, you see a lot of things on, on iOS which have a desktop counterpart, you, you know, there, there are hundreds, um, they don't ever seem to attempt to have all the features of the desktop one. I don't know whether that's sort of time constraints or hardware constraints or I don't know what, but, you know, we're trying to do a more ambitious thing and actually get every single feature from the desktop version of Designer and Photo onto the iPad, which sort of, you know, presents some problems, you know, technically and especially with UI because... We've got a hell of a lot of UI on the desktop products. You've got to squish that into a into a 12.9 or 9.7 inch screen. So you know those are the problems that we're solving. But yeah, we hope to um, you know, launch this thing at some point, and it should be a fully featured version of our apps for iOS. Amazing. I mean, there there have been a couple of different ways that people have attempted to do things. You you may remember uh, the Apple iPhoto app. Yeah. Which which uh, got discontinued. But, it, you know, they, they tried to be fully featured and do every possible thing, but they hid them under gestures that weren't discoverable. That's absolutely true. I mean, you know, we find you know, the gest all gestures really make sense until you try and do something that doesn't sort of work with the gesture. I mean, like a pinch gesture is a, is a magnifying thing. A rotate gesture should rotate something. I mean, all these things sound straightforward. But when you try to repurpose like a, a four-finger rotate or like a three finger rotate sliding left or something for yeah. some secret, secret thing, <laughs> we find it sort of all goes wrong. So we, we, we've got to balance our use of gestures with, with sort of what a user would expect to happen when they do something. And if we can't solve it with gestures, then we have to solve it with 
other UI. And that's sort of the, the thing we're fighting at the moment. You're trying to get our way through that. But yeah. It sounds like a difficult problem to solve. Can a you, little bit, yeah. Can you tell me why you're making this effort? I mean, who, who do you think your target user is for, for this? Well, for, I mean, both apps. I mean, iPads now, especially with the introduction of this larger iPad Pro, you know, the first one mm-hmm. and, and the second one, um, I suppose, um, you know, people do work on desktop computers at work or at home. But often, I mean, I think if people had a mobile version of these things that was capable, I do think, you know, people would do work using these devices. I think they've reached a, they've reached a level of maturity now where they can replace desktop computers for certain aspects of even professional work. And that's the kind of thing we're banking on. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in it. And, uh, Shane, who, uh, who was my uh, guest on the co-host on the podcast yeah, just okay. a little bit ago, um, I was asking him about his usage, and he takes the iPad and a notebook with him whenever he leaves the house, and he leaves his laptop sitting on his desk at home. I see. So he's, he's one of those users, and I asked him what he does, and he says, primarily, draw. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So uh, He sounds so, like the sort of guy we're sort of targeting, absolutely. There you have it, yeah. And, uh, and the truth is, I hope to be a user like that one day. I've, I've tried going iPad only off and on, and I'm never quite there yet. But yeah, the, you know, the, as more and more applications make the effort you guys are making to... Uh, well, that's to- it. I mean, you sort of recently saw Office, you know, come to the iPad it, as a fairly, fairly mature product. I mean, now it's pretty much got feature parity with desktop versions. So that sort of deals with Office types. It's Excel, it's PowerPoint, it's Word. But then you move more to the creative space, you know, where you need photo editors, you need you need publishing software, you need vector editing software. We don't really think anyone sort of closed the loop on that and actually got that desktop feature set down. So that's what we're trying to sort of get there first with, if you will. And can, can I ask, you know, your, your Affinity is not the first to make a vector or a raster image mm. application. Why, why Affinity? Why should people look to Affinity besides the fact that Apple named you the app of the year? Well, I mean, I think, you know, Sarah's been around for probably 25 years now, and we've been making these applications for 25 years, admittedly on Windows only for the first sort of, what, 19, 20 years of our existence. You know, we've got um, a load of experience with these things, and we have worked with hundreds of people in the industry, and we kind of think we know exactly what they want. You know, we think we know what features they want. You know, we think... Um, over time, you know, we think what features they're going to need down the line that they don't need now. So, I mean, I would say our experience in the field is our sort of main difference. I mean, also there are, you can talk about subscription licensing, uh, sorry, subscription licensing models versus one-off purchases. You can talk about all sorts of things, but um, we think that if we can produce these apps with the features that we know a professional users want um, at the prices that we produce them at, you know, we think we have quite a compelling thing for people right so, and yeah. i should mention that their, your u.s pricing is uh 49 dollars 99 cents which is quite reasonable in the scheme of of what you buy a photo editor for yeah we think so yeah we think it is well what else would you like to talk about oh, i don't know really i mean <laughs> thanks for having me on it's been sort of nice to actually get a chance to talk about you know the products that we make we sort of developers we sort of end up end up in the office typing all the time and don't often get this opportunity to and tell people what stuff we've done and are doing, actually. It's nice to talk about the iPad stuff. It only became sort of sort of public knowledge that we were doing these things um, a few weeks ago. And we sort of recently mentioned that we were we have a separate team now as well who are doing a Windows port of these things because people just keep asking us all the time, like, will you do Windows? Um, so we've got a separate bunch of guys now who are doing that, which is nice because it sort of leaves the Mac guys all together so we can do the iOS stuff together. Um yeah, I mean it's all sort of great at the moment. We're looking forward to, you know, the next few years should be should be quite exciting. Hopefully, well, it, it sounds wonderful, and I want to thank you for joining me today. No problem uh, at all. Pleasure. I, I'm your host Victor, and joining me for this segment has been Andy Summerfield of Serif, makers of Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer. Check them out on the App Store, and is t- tell me the domain. Where should people go to find out more information about these it's- products? It's affinity.serif.com. And we'll be back all next week with a uh, whole new podcast. 
Thanks again to today's sponsor, Mara, a hands-free virtual running assistant that uses cutting-edge voice recognition to help coach you to better runs. Play music, get updates on your location, pace, and weather, and compare your current speed with past runs without ever stopping to look at your phone. Using your earbuds, Mara can hear your commands and put them into action. To download your new running partner for free, visit mara.ai today. Run with a sidekick. Make every mile count. <laughs> 